Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Webinar Series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. Our uh, upcoming webinars are, are a little bit different uh, schedule. We apologize for the current um, schedule changes. Um, Joe Price's webinar that was scheduled for May 23rd is scheduled uh, rescheduled for June 12th, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Um, so we'll be hearing from Joe Price on June 12th. And uh, Catherine Grant, uh, who was supposed to be giving a webinar yesterday, uh, we've moved that webinar to June 13th on Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So we'll be hearing from Catherine on June 13th um, for that web and indexing webinar. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our web index, uh, our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. Uh, we currently, um, we just changed the URL for that website so it's a bit easier to access. Our website is fh.lib.byu.edu. So fh.lib.byu.edu. Uh, fh um, all of our webinars are recorded and uploaded uh, the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to the recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. During the webinar, if you have any technical dif difficulties, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. Um, and for today's webinar, I have also placed uh, the presentation slides from Angela uh, in the chat box, so you'll be, you'll be able to access that PDF uh, PDF in the chat box. Um, it will also be uh, that PDF will also be linked to the the post um, with the recording that will be on the website as well. Um, you're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Uh, for today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Angela Sinikis, um, who will be giving a presentation on Lithuanian um, resources for uh, Lithuanian genealogy. Angela Sinikis was born in Chicago of Lithuanian-born parents. On Saturday, she attended Lithuanian school, and on Sunday, she went to a Lithuanian language church. She was a Lithuanian scout, danced in, Lithu in Lithuanian folk dance festivals, and sang in Lithuanian choirs. She began genealogy research in 2013. When on a visit to Lithuania, she discovered a working windmill built by someone with the same surname as her great-grandfather who was a miller in the same area. That miller turned out to be an uncle of her great-grandfather's. Um, and if Angela is ready, we'll turn the time over to her for that presentation. Thank you very much, Marin. I am, thank you very much, Marin. I'm about to start the slides. Okay, so thank you. As you can tell, I was an American Monday through Fridays and I was a Lithuanian every Saturday and Sunday. So my interest in Lithuanian history and genealogy is fairly old, although I didn't start getting into it in a serious way until not too long ago, just maybe five, six years ago. There is a previous webinar before this one that you probably want to listen to if you have not yet heard it. It's the Introduction to Lithuanian Genealogy. It'll give you a lot of information about how the language and the history and the geography of the whole Lithuanian uh, environment will change the way you search for your names and where you might be searching for those names. So it's a very useful thing to also listen to before you can probably make the most use out of these resources we'll be talking about today. Like most European-based research, you need to first figure out where your ancestors came from. What village do they originate from? Because without that, it'll be hard to find records. In the olden days, most of these records were only kept in the churches. There were no civil records. So if you don't know where they came from, you won't know which church to go looking at. There's a lot of ways of doing that. The easiest way would be to start with any documents you already have in your attic or those boxes in the garage or any of your distant or near relatives might have. So even if you can't find the, the place of origin of the specific 
pair of ancestors you're looking for, since they didn't move around all that terribly much, any records you can find will be very useful. If for any reason you have no documents at all or none of the documents mention a village, there are a lot of resources available online where you might find where your ancestors came from. So for example, passenger lists. Not all passenger lists are not all years, but many of them did list where the people came from. Uh, the one on the bottom here is for one of my great, great aunts. Uh, and it says in the red circle there that she came from a place called Zagori. Well, so, uh, so the, the kinds of documents that might list this, depending on the year that your ancestors came over, would be things like passenger lists. If they decided to try to become citizens, any naturalization paperwork would require them to put their village of origin as well. For young men, they were required to register for the First World War and Second World War drafts, regardless of age, actually not just young men, any age, and that also requested the village of origin. Uh, Social Security, if they were of an age where they were eligible for Social Security, that's another place where those villages were or cities were requested. So those are all places that might help you find a village. And if all else fails, I have one more tip for you coming up in a few slides. So what do you do with something like a name of a village that doesn't currently exist in Lithuania anymore? This is a very useful website I use called maps.lt for just Lithuanian maps. It shows the tiniest little villages. Um, when you type in the name, it has to be actually typed correctly. If I had typed in Zagori, nothing would show up. So a little tip for when you are doing online searches in these different uh, databases is you can use an asterisk to mean I don't know what follows. It could be any number of letters. They could be anything. So look for everything that starts with Z-A-G in this case. And so in this case, I found five possible locations. I did know that my father's family came from the northern part of Lithuania. So I was able to figure out which of these regions uh, was the correct one. There are other places that you can find this. Now, here's the reason why the villages will not match up from the olden days to today. Today, everything is in proper Lithuania. In the olden days, depending on which olden days we're talking about, the names could have been in a Polish version because most Catholic priests were Polish and many of the records were written in Polish or before that they were written in Latin. And so it might be a Latin version of the village. Then when the, around the middle of the 1800s, when the Tsarist government required all writing in Lithuania to be using the Cyrillic language, the Cyrillic alphabet, everything was in Russian. Uh, so the, and then if you were Lutheran, the minister might have been German, and so the village might have had a very German sound to it. So that's why the villages aren't always going to match up, and you need tools to translate the old name to a new name. Well, one that's very useful is the one I have on the screen, Jewish Gen. If there were any Jewish people in that village, they would uh, probably be using a German sort of version of that name. You can try typing it in using that wild card either the asterisk for any unknown number of letters or a question mark for just one letter that you're unsure of. And there are lots of other places as well. Um, I showed you Maps LT and Jewish Gen. Another one is fallingrain.com that's got a lot of uh, Lithuanian village transliterations there. And if your family tended to come from that western part of Lithuania that is called Lithuania Minor these days, uh, used to be part of East Prussia, there are a couple of tools that'll help you there as well. I'm gonna show you one uh, next. And that's called Kartenmeister, Mapmaster in German. So the first thing you wanna do is choose English as your language, and then everything will work perfectly in English. That's not true for all sites, but it will work for this one. Now, if you have a German sounding village name or Polish name, you can try typing either one of them in and you can use those wildcards. And I strongly recommend that you read the introduction because the introduction gives you lots of tips and advice for how to try different versions of spellings. So it's a very useful thing, not just for its own site, but anytime you're doing online searches for place names that uh, might be Germanic, might be Polish, but they're really supposed to be Lithuanian. You just choose how many records you want to see before you have to refresh the page. And then uh, what it'll show you when you click submit is one or more possibilities for that village. So here I typed in Heidekrug, 
which was one of the places that was in some of the records that I had. And there were actually five different places in five different counties. So it would help if you knew generally what part of the country or East Prussia your family came from. But if not, just look through them all. I knew mine came from the, the not only the county, not only the city of Heidekrug, but also the county. So when you click on the village name, you're going to learn a lot of things from this website. So if you do have relatives from that part of Lithuania, this will be very useful. You will learn what the current name is in Lithuanian. It's Shiluta. But above that red circle, you'll also see that there are the, some of the old names for it, both German and Polish sounding names and about what year those were common. What you'll also see is the population of that place in different time periods. But what's really useful is it will show you what was the nearest Lutheran church, what was the nearest Catholic church. So that'll help you know which church books to look for if your family lived in Shaluta, because they may not have had a church right in town. There's also going to be a link to Google Maps so you can see where this village that you're looking at is. Or if you had five different options, you could see where all of them would be plotted one by one. Another one that's very useful, but unfortunately, even when you choose English on this one, it won't show most of the screenshots in English and none of the drop down menus from the top tab will be in English either. So this one I'm going to walk you through a little bit to, to make sure you know what to click on to get the most use out of this one. This is a an online dictionary of Lithuanian surnames. And it's called Vamagas because the man who put it together was named Dr. Vamagas. Uh, they did a survey or a not so much a census, but they were looking for how many people with different Lithuanian surnames lived in different parts of Lithuania. And this was during the period of independence between World War I and World War II. It's a really useful guide for several different reasons. So when you're going to use it, there's a couple things you need to know is that, well, as I mentioned, most of it will be in Lithuanian. There will be little bits in English, but not the tabs. So if you're going to be searching for your own family surnames, what you want to do is go to the tab that says Lietuvių Pavardžių Žodinas, which means Lithuanian Surname Dictionary. And then the option you want to choose from that list is Pavardžių Dažnumas, frequency of the surnames. And once you do that, the first thing you're going to get is a screen that says, I agree not to infringe on the copyrights of the authors. And that's what all of that says. So just to click on the green box, which is agree, means uh, agree in Lithuanian sutinko, and then you can move on. It'll give you a box where you can type in the surname that you're interested in researching. And as you start typing letter by letter, it'll start showing you all the options that might flow out of that beginning root, which is very useful. In my case, Timpa, exactly that name is what I was looking for. So I click on Timpa, and this is the kind of information you're going to see. The name will be first repeated in blue, but right below it will be the name showing an accent mark for where the accent falls on the name. And sometimes the accent can be on different syllables and it's almost considered a different family name in some cases. So they'll have different versions of that name uh, shown throughout uh, Lithuania, how many different places, different pronunciations of the name appeared in. I'm going to show you a couple of elements of this so you can figure out what this is because it's a little bit in code. It's all abbreviated. The first thing that's abbreviated are the village names. Uh, that's the first two red circles here. That shows in these villages or towns or cities, we had people with the surname Timpa. The next red circle, the third one, shows if a village had more than one family with that name, how many families there were. And then the fourth circle in red shows the total number of families in Lithuania during that period that had that surname. So not very common, only 13 families had that surname. The other parts of the information in that first paragraph show where did this name came, come from? And if it's similar to a surname like that in other languages and other countries, that's what this next part refers to. So I've given you a little legend here. These abbreviations are also available on the website, but it's going to say what the most similar Russian or German or Polish or Belarusian name might have been. And then the bottom paragraph in my listing will show if there's any relationship between this surname and some common Lithuanian word or concept. So for example, if it's similar to a occupation or some kind of geographical, topographical location, 
or just some other thing. So in my case, timpa also in Lithuanian means something like an elastic band or to stretch something. So it's possible that's what my surname was based on, but because of the location of this, this family being close to where that East Prussian border was, I'm thinking mine is probably most likely coming from the, the similar German name. So once you've done that, you've got your listing, you need to translate it. And to do that, you need that translation for all the abbreviations. So the pull down menu for that is called Sutrumpinamai, which means abbreviations. And there's abbreviations for those literature citations, the other abbreviations, and the middle one, the second one is the one you're going to want. When you click on that, you're going to see the abbreviations for all these place names where the name appeared. Couple of things about this. In Lithuanian, many of the same village names appear all over. Yeah, I know it's a small country, but they're repeated over and over and over again. And partly it's because many of the location names are based on the geography of the area, like Ujupe, meaning beyond the river, or Antkalnis, which means on the hill. So there's lots of rivers and lots of hills and lots of places with the same name. So it'll be very helpful to you to see what I've circled here in red. It'll show the region. The R is for Rayonas, region. So it'll tell you which of, of some villages that might appear in multiple places, which one they're talking about where this name appears. Now, a couple of things about alphabetical order in Lithuanian. In Lithuanian, the letter Y immediately follows the letter I. And that's because the sound of it, the pronunciation of it is very similar. The other thing is there are a couple of letters, C, S, and Z, that have two different forms and they sound different. So the C, for example, would be a TS sound. And if you have a little V shape over it, that becomes a CH. It's almost like adding an H to it. So if you have a place name that starts with a CH sound, it'll be after this, the regular C. So always look at it, though, by the sequence of the abbreviation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because as you notice, if you look through the whole list, that's not going to match up the same alphabetical order of the villages themselves. Now I said that there would be a trick that if you still had not been able to find your village of origin, there might be a way to sort of back into it. And this is what you want, might wanna do. If you have the surnames of a married couple on your tree, if you know both of their names, look up both of their names on Vonlegas. What you wanna do now is take a look at which villages do both surnames have in common? Because in the old days, they didn't have anything like Match.com to go find a spouse. You pretty much found spouses from nearby. You went to the same church. Uh, you might have gone to the same school. You saw each other at the weekly market. So they're going to be near each other before they even marry. So in this case, I found three places where two ancestors of mine had families living. Uh, and if you take these three villages and you plot them on a map, you'll see they're not all that far apart. And that starts giving you a little geographic borderline for where you might want to look for your ancestors' records rather than any church anywhere in Lithuania. So it's not a guarantee, and it certainly doesn't work if you have two very common surnames. But if at least one of the surnames is less common, that will help you identify where you might want to start looking. So let's say that at this point you have found a village of origin. What do you do with it? Well, you need to go online as a starting point to see what you can discover on all these amazing databases we have available now that we never had in the past. Not everything will be online, but I'm going to share with you a lot of resources for where you might start looking. For most people in Lithuania, they're Catholic. So most of your ancestors will likely also be Roman Catholic. For those records, you can find the church books for all of these places shown on the map with the little red dots on one particular site called epaveldas.lt. There's many different types of documents on there, but one of the types of documents is church books. It's a little hard to use though, because it's all in Lithuanian. All the instructions are in Lithuanian. Instead of spending 20 minutes walking you through it here, fortunately, there is a wonderful resource at a website called gen.wooyd.org. And if you do the, the slash epaveldas, it'll take you right to the right section of it where it will walk you through how to use it. And it's not just what to click on, but it also gives you tips on things like how do you understand a Latin church record or a Russian church record? How do you interpret 
different um, spellings, their different symbols. So it's a really useful tool. I would look at that first before you jump to Epiveldus itself. Otherwise, it might kind of freak you out and you'll back away and never go back again. So first, read the tips. If you have Lutheran relatives, these are available on microfilm through the Family History Library. At all of them in the Salt Lake City Library for sure. Microfilms used to be rented out to local Family History Center libraries. I don't think they're doing that much anymore, but many of these records have now been put online. They are not necessarily indexed, but if you know the church book and you know the years in which a record would appear, if there's a little camera icon next to that listing in the, in the family search search, that means you can click on that and you will actually be able to go through the page by page microfilmed and photographed copies of all those records. One little tip about looking through all these books, not every church and not every year, but at the end of a year, very often the minister or the priest would do an index of the names of the children that were born, or the people who got married, or the people who died, and then listed right next to that name would be the number of the entry in that previous year. So before you start searching through any given year, first jump to the end of it to see if there happens to be an index, and that will save you lots and lots of time. Jewish records, on the other hand, many of them have been indexed and they're available online. So if that's what you're looking for, you're going to have a lot faster result in looking for your family members. Now again, if you had family that were in that western part of Lithuania and the area that used to be East Prussia, which most people think of as German, but East Prussia, Prussia itself used to be a Baltic tribe. The Prussians had a very similar language to Lithuanian and they just sort of got taken over by the Teutonic Knights and became much more German. But anyway, if you do have ancestors from that area, there are a couple of additional databases that will be very useful to you. Ancestry.com and, uh, and Family Search, many of those most common search engines you'll look for have a lot of well-indexed German records. And so those East Prussian churches, both Catholic and Lutheran, will be indexed and easily searchable. There's also an, another URL I've given you here for the Berlin archives that'll take you to the Prussian church, church books there. I also want to share with you in just a little more detailed another website called Memoland Records, Memo being the German name for Kleipeda. And when you use that website, uh, it's, I've given you a very long URL here to jump you to the exactly right place where you can quickly get information about your surnames. But all you need to do is click on the alphabet letter that begins your surname, find your surname, click on it, and what you're going to get is not just all the occurrences of that surname, but all the related surnames. So for example, male and then unmarried or married female surnames have slightly different endings on them in Lithuanian and also in the old Prussian as well. So it'll show you all of the related names with one search. You don't have to keep searching each name that you think might be related. Very handy dandy. FamilySearch.org. I think a lot of us, when we use some of these search engines, we typically are putting in a name and looking for any records for that particular name. And that's a very useful thing to do. But something a lot of people don't do is search the catalog. So for example, when you're looking at the Family Search catalog and you type in as a place name Lithuania, you can find listings of many different places within Lithuania and then see all the records available for them. Or you could just type in that name as it is, or even the old German or old Polish name for that place. And it'll, it'll still pop up as well. Now on the right-hand side, this is a list of so many different types of documents about Lithuania that are available online beyond church records, some civil records, property records, all kinds of lists and uh, maps and histories. So very useful. You could spend months reading through everything that's available there when you look at the catalog. Similarly, Ancestry.com, you can also search their catalog. And when you do and type in the word Lithuania, you're going to see 60 different databases they have. The first one you'll see is Lithuanian Catholic Baptisms, Marriages, and Burials. And it looks like that will be a wonderful resource because it's going to be indexed. Unfortunately, it only has two locations in there. One of them being Vilnius, which is the capital and the largest single city. So if your family's from Vilnius, this will be helpful. And the other one happens to be Zagare, 
the place that my father's family is from that you saw on the maps near the beginning of the session. So I got really lucky. I was able to take my family's line back way into the early 1700s so far because it has been indexed. And I'm hoping that they keep adding more and more indexed records over time. The other thing you can do when you look at the catalog is you can actually look at the photocopies of the original books. So you just click on one of those age, uh, the, one of those ranges of years, and then you can look at the church books for that particular time period. The only thing is you have to be a little careful. Even though there's only two places that these records are from, Vilnius and Jagade, you'll only see both options if you click on marriage. So if you're looking for records from Vilnius and, and choose the births option, you won't see it. You have to choose the baptisms option. So in Vilnius, their books are baptisms and burials. And in Jagade, they were births and deaths. So just have to play around with things until you find what you're looking for. And there are a lot of civil records there as well, if, if you saw in that previous slide, and a lot of Jewish records from before, during, and after the Holocaust. So another wonderful resource if you look at the catalog, not just the original records. I'm also providing you with links to a lot of, of the archives for other nearby neighboring countries to Lithuania. Because if you look here at the map, the red border shows the current border of Lithuania. Those blue, yellow, and green areas were the way that when Lithuania was part of the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire, this is the three governing units or gubernias that they divided everything into. And so you can see they don't stay neatly within the current day's borders. Neither did your ancestors. Your ancestors may have moved around a little bit, uh, and what you might have to do is go find some of these records in the archives of other countries if you're somewhere near that border. If you have family members who were exiled from Lithuania around World War II, you've got a number of resources, either exiled or imprisoned or murdered. So the International Tracing Service Online is a service that was started after World War II to try to help reunite families. So a lot of people didn't know what happened to their families if they went to concentration camps, if they survived or if they didn't. But it's not just concentration camps. A lot of people were simply displaced because the war overran where they were living and they had to run and they may have gotten separated from families that way. So the International Tracing Service has recently put a lot of documents online that you can search, which is lovely because you used to have to write to them with a letter and wait months often for any kind of response. The other thing is displaced persons or DPs. One of the things that happened at the beginning of World War II is that Germany and Russia, the Soviet Union, had a secret pact that Germany was gonna be allowed to take over Poland and the Soviet Union would be allowed to take over Lithuania. And they all agreed on this before they became enemies in World War II. The one deal, one part of this deal was that before the Soviet Union marched into Lithuania, Germany was going to offer an opportunity for people that might have a German connection to quote unquote, come home to Germany. Now, what does that mean? They meant anyone who spoke German, anyone who was Lutheran, or anyone who had a name that sounded like it might have been Germanic. So among others, my family, both sides of my family, my father's and my mother's side, became displaced persons and went to Germany. Mind you, my family didn't speak German. They were Lutheran though. And I know that from the research I've done, even on my mother's side, that's right there on that Prussian border, they've been living in that area since at least the early 1700s, but they were considered Germans coming home to Germany for the purposes of the, uh, the return to the homeland, which saved them from being part of the Soviet Union. And many of my other relatives, unfortunately, had to live through all that. So there's three different major types of records that are invaluable available on this. One is a set of microfilms that are alphabetized of pretty much like the uh, cards that were filled out when people came to the DP camps. These are available only on microfilm at the moment in the Salt Lake City Family History Library. Just look at the catalog and copy or paste this Einwanderer Gentrale Stelle. This would be the records of the wanderers that came to Germany. The card I'm showing you here is an example from my grandmother. 
Sometimes they also include a picture on here. But there's things I knew. I knew her birth date, her birthplace, all of that. But these cards also list such interesting things like all the illnesses that these people had that they survived, obviously. All of the working skills that they had for the types of jobs they might be able to get. Uh, on the back, sometimes they also let people list other family members that might have come somewhere to Germany that they'd like to be in the same DP camp with them. So this is helpful, but you have to be there in Salt Lake City at the moment to see it. But it is alphabetized, even though the spellings are a little different. It says Sinitsky here, although my family is Sinitskus in Lithuania. Online, though, there are a whole other set of records. Once people were in the camps, I think the Germans were trying to do a gigantic master family tree before we ever did these things online. These records, uh, I've given you a link to one of these. Uh, they've got, I think, maybe another one or two uh, for all of these different people. This is not indexed and it's not alphabetized. If you're going to use these, you have to start on page one and just keep looking until you find names that look familiar to you. But it's worth it, because when you find family, you learn so much. So here's an example of my grandmother's great uncle, and he also came into the DP camps. What you're going to see here at the top would be his name, his occupation, his birth date, and his birthplace. If a person's married, you'll see the wedding date. If he has parents, or if he knows who the parents were, it'll list their birth dates, birthplaces, and if they're still alive, where they are. Are they in the DP camps or are they back in Lithuania somewhere? Also, the wife's birth information and the parents of the wife as well. Now, mind you, if this family came to Germany with their parents, each of their parents would have a similar sheet. You could be adding a whole nother layer of ancestors to your tree just from these kinds of records. And the final information, many of these people when they came into the camps and wanted to be accepted were asked to write a one or two page handwritten summary of their lives, their own autobiography and why they should be here coming into the DP camps. Those are not in Germany, they're not in Lithuania, they're in the United States because when the U.S. Army came into Berlin they liberated these documents and they're all in our national archives and you can write to the national archives and request these types of documents some exist for some family members and some don't the other thing is once you have all these exiles who have been leaving lithuania for various reasons economic reasons before world war one uh, political reasons about world war ii and later they wanted to stay in touch with the old country and with each other and what's happening. There was a newspaper started called Draugas. It was headquartered in Lithuania. It, I mean, in uh, Chicago, which is like the largest place of Lithuanians outside of Lithuania was Chicago. Draugas means friend. In the most recent years, they have started indexing their newspapers. So you can look up by year and go through different pages and find perhaps the obituary of a relative of yours that died somewhere outside of Lithuania after leaving Lithuania. Another resource also in Chicago is the Balzekas Museum. It's a real museum you can visit, but they also have a lot of resources online. This one, however, requires a subscription fee to use their genealogy services. It's not huge, but still, it's something that uh, would be a last ditch effort if all the free resources fail you. And then most tragic would be KGB files. So Lithuania currently has 2.8 million people. It is estimated that 300,000 Lithuanians were imprisoned, shot, or sent to Siberia during the time the Soviet Union was back in Lithuania from the beginning of World War I to um, 1991. These records are available in Lithuania. They're not online, but you can go to this website I've given you and write for the information you're looking for. So it's not only the people the KGB tortured and murdered, but also who the people in the KGB were, who the informers were, who the people who were the enemies of the KGB were. And these would be the partisans, the guerrilla fighters that lived in the forests, the forest brothers, and were trying to just get the Soviet Union out of, out of Lithuania while they waited for America to come liberate the country. Because the voice of America kept telling them, we're coming, we're coming, keep the faith. Well, we never came.
So let's say that you have done everything you can, you have found a lot of information about your family with all these resources, but you're still kind of stuck in some places or you've hit some brick walls. There's an enormous number of online discussion groups that are very helpful. They'll either help direct you to different resources, help you interpret what you're finding. Um, and I'm going to give you a list of the ones that I use the most often. I have all of these bookmarked on my own um, browser because I use them all so often. I'm just going to mention two of them. If you have Lutheran relatives, the Lutheran genealogy website has an enormously useful resource. There is an amazing woman named Diane Leroy who just passed earlier this year. She spent years looking at the microfilms for these Lutheran churches and transcribing them into English in Word documents. So they are now searchable. Obviously there's typos and spelling errors here and there and different spellings for surnames, but those documents can be downloaded from that website. The second one in yellow that I wanna highlight is genealogy translations. Regardless of the language, Anyone can go onto this site and once every 24 hours ask for some genealogical document to be translated. And typically they get responses within that 24 hours. If not, you can elevate it up higher into the website and then it'll get translated within the next 24 hours. There's one that I did not list there because I wanted to give you a little more detail about it. It's a Lithuanian DNA Facebook group. So you have to have already had a DNA test in order to use this. And you need to upload it to a place called GEDmatch, GEDmatch.com. It's a wonderful site where no matter which testing service you may have had your DNA tested in, you can upload it. So now when you're comparing your DNA looking for relative matches, it's not just in the one service that you used for getting your DNA done. It'll be anyone from any of the services who wants to compare their DNA with other people. So first you have to do that. Now I mentioned that a lot of these different discussion groups uh, require you to become a member. And usually it's automatic. You ask to become a member and they say, sure, why not? For this one, they won't accept you until you provide a good amount of information about your own genealogy. Because the purpose here is for people to collaborate with each other and build their trees together. So the kinds of information they're asking for are the kinds of information you'll see when you get a list of your matches. So this is an example. I've blacked out here the, uh, any private information. But what you'll see is that it, each individual's GEDmatch number, so if you wanna do a one-to-one -one comparison, you can see on which chromosomes you are matching different people. So if you know that there are certain relatives you already know of, your siblings, your cousins, your parents, uh, you'll know how you're related to certain people through certain chromosomes. So that can be very helpful. The second thing is if you look at the fourth column from the left, it says number of generations. That's how many generations you'd have to go back to get to your, your earliest common ancestor. So some of these are getting pretty far apart, but with some of these resources we have available now, it's getting easier and easier to, do a, to find a search. So my top match here was a woman who had two names that she knew of when she first joined the site. One was her grandmother, Anne Klein, and uh, her grandfather named Willenbrecht. That's all she pretty much knew. Well, she was my top match, and I'll show you more about her near the very end of the presentation and how we can use this information to find how we're related to people. DNA can also help figure out some gaps or kinks in your family tree. So if you look at my heritage coming up on the left here, going up to my second times, two times great grandfather, Mick Schneiderat, he was born in 1832 or thereabouts. Unfortunately, the church records for where he was living don't start until 1834. <laughs> so I was having very skimpy information about who his parents might be. There was just one reference during one of his four marriages of his father's first name, and that was it. So I didn't know for sure which of several people with the very same name was my Endrik Schneidera. Well, it took several years, but all of a sudden, within a few months, I had two DNA matches that also had Schneiderats on their tree. And they went up to Eva Schneiderat, who was a step sibling of my grandfather, great grandfather. And the reason I know that is because it says how far apart our relationship is. Now, because their ancestor Eva was born in 1849, there were a lot more pieces of information about her father and mother. And I was able to piece things together a little more tightly so I can say for sure 
their ancestor Endric Schneiderat is the same one as my Endric Schneiderat. And so then I was able to expand that tree even further with Endric's siblings and even his parents. So the DNA testing can be very useful in those gaps you might have on your tree or the things where you have a pretty good idea that someone's your relative, but you really can't put it on your tree until you know for sure. Another discussion group that's not on Facebook, but is the first one I ever used and is what just inspired me to volunteer and share whatever help I can offer with other people is the people I met at the Yahoo Lithuanian genealogy group. So I've given you the link for how to get on there and request membership, but you first have to have a Yahoo account and Yahoo accounts are free. So just create an account and then you'll be able to access the group. They only ask for a couple of things for you to do. One would be when you have the subject line of your request that you put the surnames of the people you're looking for. That'll just encourage people who might be uh, related to you to make sure that they respond to what your request is. The second thing is be very specific on what you're looking for. Don't just say looking for any and all information about so-and-so. That's a little too vague. What you also wanna do is provide all the information you already know about these people. And if there are online links to some of these records, provide the links as well. So they can see everything you know and don't waste their time telling you things you already know and just help you with the things you don't know. And there's a lot of other useful sites here that I'm going to list, some discussion forums, some that just have different types of resources. Um, but the one I wanna mention just for a little bit longer is the Foundation for East European Family History Studies, FIFIS for short. They have uh, some resources about Lithuanian documents and articles that have appeared in their journal about Lithuanian genealogy research. But what I find most useful about them is they have a conference early every August for Eastern European genealogy. And they have not only information about the Baltics, but other kinds of workshops that you will find very helpful. Things like how to read Cyrillic so you can understand how to pronounce it. So you, if you see it as Russian language record in Lithuania, you can make sense of the surname at least, if nothing else. It'll have records on how to interpret old fashioned German and Latin handwriting. It'll have information on how to find that village of origin, how to interpret DNA. So it has lots of useful things coming up early every August. The advantage of this as well is that the conference is held in the hotel that is right next door to the Family History Library. So all those things that are available only on microfilm, you can head across the, the little alleyway there into the library and look up all of those documents before or after the conference. So make sure you plan to stay there a little longer than just the conference if you go. I've given you lots and lots of tips on how to find these things on your own, uh, how to get help from people online, but sometimes the only option left is you need to write to the official Lithuanian archives that has the single largest compendium of all available documents there. So I've given you the, a link to their website. I've circled in red though which archives you need to correspond with because there are several and they all hold different types of information. So make sure you write to the state historical archives. It's fairly reasonable and fairly fast if you just need one record. So let's say that you have the name of your ancestor and you have a pretty good idea of their birth date and where they were born and which religion they followed. If you send all that information to them, they'll be able to get you a photocopy of that record within a, a few short weeks and it's not very expensive. If you have less information though, and they have to look through several books for many multiple years, it'll cost you more and it of course will take you longer. So another thing you might want to consider is hiring a researcher in Vilnius who has, would have access to the, the archives in person. I found mine just by Googling genealogy researchers in Vilnius, and I was very happy with him. But the Yahoo group has also put together a short list of some of the researchers that have helped members of that group that uh, they all gave them you know, top, top marks for being really good. So they'll not only get you the documents, they'll also translate them for you. And often they'll help you understand how these different parts of the tree fit together. Those cost more, of course, because they're doing a lot more work for you. And I want to close with just a couple of tips on building your tree. So let's say you found your village of origin. Let's say you found records for your ancestors. But the problem is you're probably finding records for multiple people with the same name, born about the same time, 
born in about the same location going to the same church. And this is not uncommon because many names were repeated in families over and over and over. They named children after their parents, their grandparents, their brothers, their sisters, and this will happen in every generation and across the board. So it'll be cousins and second cousins reusing the same names. This can get confusing, especially when you're trying to make sure you've built an accurate tree. So I just have a couple of tips here. Pay attention to the village that people are said to be from, because the church will be in one place, but the, the records will typically show you what village they were living in, like where were the parents living when the child was born? Where were the villages that the bride and groom came from? Or when someone dies, what village were they living in at the time? And where do they think they were born? So these are very useful because you might have several different branches with the same surname, repeating the same first names, but you can track them down on separate pieces of paper by the village that they're coming from. And then some of them are gonna move, but they moved around a lot less often than, than we would in these modern days. So the village is a really important thing to keep track of. The other thing you might need to do is not just build a vertical family tree, like your father, grandfather, great-grandfather, two times great-grandfather. You might want to build out the trees for all of their siblings as well. Because, let me give you an example. I had one ancestor that I was pretty sure I had found his correct birth record. But the problem was the village he was born in is not the village he said he was born in when he got married. And it's not that village that he listed or that was listed for him when he died. So I thought, ah, it's so close, but it's not quite right. Well, once I built out his whole sibling history, I saw that he and one of his siblings were in fact born in the village that my birth record showed he was born in, but all of the following siblings were born in the village that he said he was born in. Because when they moved, he was only two years old. He had no idea he was born in the village that he was really born in. So what he used was the wrong village. It was the village that his siblings were born in and he had lived in his whole life. So that'll help you make sure that you've got the right record for the right person as well. Another thing is, you're going to find perhaps five or six candidates for the same person because the name will be identical. One thing you want to start doing then is check for deaths because it will show if some of these people died before reaching marriage age to become an ancestor of yours. So you can eliminate them. The other thing you want to check for then is those people who survived childhood, did they marry someone else? And were they having children with someone else at the same time your correct ancestor was having children? So you can eliminate them as well. Another thing that you can use, this is sad, but many times not only did children die young, spouses died as well. We didn't have antibiotics, there wars, famines, pestilence were going on. So one of the things that you might find is that you have a pair of ancestors and their wedding information is fairly skimpy, but perhaps one of those ancestors died and the other ancestor remarried. It's perhaps in that next marriage record that there'll be more details available. So don't stop just with your own blood relatives. Go and find all of those step parents and step siblings as well, because you might find a lot more information that way. And one other thing to remember is when you're looking up records of births and deaths, they might not appear in the year you're expecting. If they were born or died near the end of the year, these church books were capturing baptisms and burials, not births and deaths. So the record might actually appear in January of the following year. So I'm just gonna close with an example. That woman who I matched at the four and a half generation difference level, she knew that her great grandmother's name was Anne Klein. Well, I have to tell you, there's a whole bunch of Anne Kleins in our tree in that village. So we had to start narrowing it down. And I found just four that were about the right age to have a child in 1931 and looked up who they were. And then I tried to see if they died. And the first three Anne Kleins all died in the same year. So there must've been some kind of epidemic going around. But the fourth one did not. And as it turned out, that was the correct one that uh, was on her tree and led up to the common ancestor on my tree. So. I think we have time for a couple of questions. You can type them into the chat box. And if something occurs to you after this opportunity for the, the chat questions, my email is on the title page of the slides and you can just feel free to email me afterwards.
Uh, it looks like we do have a comment from Eddie. She says, or he says, uh, other than EWZ, are there other resources in Salt Lake City of interest not available online? Oh, uh, an enormous number. So for example, there are a lot of books. You cannot check them out of the library. Uh, they might be available at other libraries for interlibrary loan, but there are books you might not even know existed until you show up there. Uh, for example, there are books that list people who were expelled from Germany uh, during the wars of religion when the Lutherans were being expelled, the, what they call the Salzburg expulsion. And some of them went as far afield as Savannah, Georgia, and others went to um, the East Prussian area of Lithuania. So I just found so many books just looking through the shelves and different call letters. So microfilms and books both. And then of course you've got the help of all the people who are there, the very experienced uh, volunteers that can lead you to things that you might not have known were there or who can translate things for you. There's also some documents that are digitized. There's a little camera icon, but you are not allowed to look at them yourself. But people who are members of the Mormon church and are authorized to, they can look at it. So in some cases, they could let you look over their shoulders, for example, while they're uh, getting those screens that you need access to. Um, we have two more comments. Um, Mary D. Adams says, thank you very much. Very interesting. And the... Uh, the person that just made that comment that you answered, Angela, says thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it's just a fascinating place to go. Uh, they've got so many records, not just obviously Lithuanian, but so many other, if you've got multiple ethnicities, um, I would spend several good days there. You might want to take little breaks, though. It gets a little tiresome sometimes to look at microfilms all, all day long, but uh, definitely worth your time. Um, I see a question about um, links in the chat box. I'll share that file um, with Angela's slides one more time. Um, if you aren't able to access that, our website uh, will have all of this information included in the recording post. Um, and I'll share the website at the end of the closing announcements and you'll be able to access the information that, that you need. Um, but I'll just share that PDF really quick. Um, and everyone will be able to access that. And I did double check all the links just yesterday. So things do change, but, uh, and there are some sites that are run by volunteers that might go down for a day or two. That's happened with Vamagas. That's also happened with um, the Memoland one, but they come back fairly quickly. All right, if that's all the questions we have for right now, I'll just go to the closing announcements. Um, I'll keep the chat box open in case there's any last minute questions and uh, read those out to Angela. Um, so just to reiterate, um, next week we will have um, a webinar with James Tanner. Um, he will be presenting um, getting the rest of the gold out of the Google gold mine for genealogists. Uh, so that'll be on June 6th at thurs Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Um, the previous uh, webinars um, that were postponed are rescheduled for the 12th and the 13th of June. Um, Joe Price will be presenting on June 12th, uh, that Wednesday at 3 p.m. Um, he'll be giving a presentation on tree extending hints. Um, and then we will have a presentation from Catherine Grant on web indexing on the 13th. We do apologize uh, for that um, schedule change. Um, there uh, just have been some um, changes in our presenter schedules uh, last minute. So we hope that you can join us um, with those webinars. Um, and also, uh, if you were not able to join us at the beginning of this webinar. There will be a recording on our YouTube channel and our website as well. Um, so you can access this, uh, this webinar um, after it's posted. Uh, it looks like we do have one last question. Um, 
And the question is, to be able to enter Germany as a DP and enter a camp, what kind of documents did a refugee have to show? My father-in-law was Catholic and Lithuanian and ended up in a DP camp in Germany. Yeah, a lot of them did. So it, I'm not actually sure what was required because many of them came with almost nothing. They ran overnight. I know my mother's family was like that. They said 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 something horrible to a Russian officer and knew that by the morning they'd be all arrested. So they left that night with almost nothing. Um, but my grandfather, one of my grandfathers was Catholic. He was married to a Lutheran. So I don't really know what it took to say that there was a German connection there. I think even if you had a relative who might have had a Germanic name or was Lutheran, obviously if you had your baptismal certificate or a uh, um, a confirmation record of being Lutheran, that would help. But I know that no, it wasn't only Lutherans that came in. But that's a good question. That's something I'll have to look up. As she says, thank you. All right. Um, so if you uh, need to access this webinar again, um, you can visit our website. Our website is fh.lib.byu.edu, um, or you can look up our YouTube channel, um, and that's just BYU FHL. Um, and there, that this recording of this webinar will be posted on Monday, um, if not earlier, and. Um, so that'll have all the links to the the so it'll have a link to our website um with the recording and um angela's slides the pdf of that slide so if you need to access any of the links that angela shared you'll just download that pdf and i'll have all of the links in that um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And um, Angela's email was in the previous um, slides. So those will be made available with the post as well. Um, I hope that you have a great weekend. And we hope to have you join us on June 6th for James Tanner's uh, webinar presentation. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.